have a lot of presenters with us here today, including from the Paper Cut Zine Library, which is located in Harvard Square in the Democracy Center. We have Seth, who is a local resident of Watertown and a frequent volunteer at Hatch. We have Tim, who runs the Zine Collection at the Somerville Public Library, and Adrian, who works with the Boston Compass Free Newsletter and the Rochester Art Project. Um, and we are waiting on a couple more presenters who may or may not show up, but they are Layela and um, Hassan. So let's, let me just give you an introduction to uh, Zine Month at Wonkertown and what we're trying to do with this. So the library has recognized that there's a lack of um, local and underrepresented voices in the collection. And zines are, uh, as a self-published indie kind of medium, is an easier way for people to make their opinions known and their thoughts, to get their thoughts out on paper. Uh, sorry, I'm also letting people in at the same time. On paper when mainstream publishing is not so open to their voices and we'd like to invite everyone um, locally but also maybe from other towns to participate in making their own zines and submitting them to our collection so that we can make you part of uh, an institution I guess if you want to be part of an institution uh, we're giving out free kits at the main library on 123 Main Street in Watertown. So if you want to pick up your own supplies and um, make your own single sheet zine, we will print 10 copies for you if you bring in like your physical thing. And you get to keep most of them. We'll just take one and add it to our collection. So um, I'm going to... Wait, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Which part? Uh, about what you'll put in your collection? Like oh, you said you pick up a kit and then... Yeah, you get a paper bag full of like paper, Sharpies, and um, scissors and tape. You take it and if you feel like it, you can bring us the cuisine that you make and we'll make 10 copies. You get the rest, but we'll keep one for our collection. That's so, awesome. That's so cool. So we're only doing this for the month of February but we're hoping to keep collecting zines to build up a collection going forward if there's enough interest from the community. So I'm going to like pass this over to our presenters because there's a lot of you guys and not a lot of time. So Paper Cut Zine, wanna start us off? Sure, I'll go. I mean, there's three of us here um, just introducing ourselves. Mm -hmm. I'm Gabby. Um, I'm the volunteer coordinator at Paper Cut, so I'm usually around to keep the um, when when we're not in a pandemic and we're open at Democracy Center. Um, I'm usually there to keep the uh, library open and to have uh, volunteers come in working on our cataloging project. We're in the process of like recataloging um, our zines so that they're easier for people to find when they come in to look for something and. Um, now that with pandemic life, we're kind of um, been moving that over to creating a virtual catalog. So that's something that we're really excited about. And I personally just really like zines and um, kind of found paper cut through um, going there and then meeting cool people. I met Mona was the first person that I met um, back in the day when I first went to paper cut before it was in Democracy Center. And then I started volunteering there and I've been volunteering since November of last year, or maybe longer than that. I can't remember. Um, hi, I'm Taylor. I am also one of the librarians for Perfect Zine Library. Um, I started last November during the pandemic, so you've definitely been there longer, uh, Gabby. <laughs> okay. um, uh, since I'm newer, I've just been helping out plan our monthly skill shares that happen every first Tuesday of the month. Um, and you can find more info on our website and stuff. Um, and I also help maintain our website and social media and hopefully being able to help out with our caught up cataloging, but it's a bit difficult since we're not in person. Um, yeah, and I found out about Papercut through uh, Gabby. We used to be roommates. Uh, and then I decided to study this uh, for my master's degree and uh, get involved in the library. Marie just joined, who also was part of Papercut. 
Hi, Marie. Hey. Did you want to say anything? Uh, I joined a bit late, so I don't want to steal anyone's spotlight. Just hanging out, and I think so. Um, yeah, um, I think zines are really important technology is what they call it now, but it is a really great way to communicate and organize with the community. And um, like we were talking about before, there can be a lot of obstacles in terms of being published and being printed. So um, it's a very easy way to make an equitable platform, if you will. Um, there is also, things that go with it in terms of once you publish something and it's out there. And if you're somebody that might come from a background where you're fear of political persecution, it can be you know, a little complicated, um, but for the most part, uh, most people can have, you know, find access to paper and a pen and a photocopier. And that's why zines are great. And I was attracted to um, paper cut. Tim? Was Seth next? Oh, was I? I'll go. Um, hi, I'm Seth, uh, Seth Deitch. I have been making zines for a long, long time. Um, and I actually sort of come from a background of zine making. Um, can, um, this one was made uh, by my father in the early 40s. Uh, was a fanzine for Hollywood uh, about about Hollywood stars. Um, they did it multicolor mimeograph, which is something that's very very difficult to do. I'm not sure I could do it. Um, but uh, hold on a second. But also, give me a. This is um. Yeah, so I started out with this magazine called Get Stupid, which has several incarnations. Um, you can see an issue from each one here. Um, sort of surrealist humor for immature adults. Uh, I'll be posting links in the chat for people who want to actually read the content of these. Um, This is something more recent it's called the Book of Dreams that was illustrated version of things from my dream journals. Um, now this is a zine that was done by my brother Simon in the early 60s. It was a science fiction fan zine. Like I say, it runs in the family. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. I actually was when I started making my first zines, I was uh, being a restaurant manager. And uh, I decided to uh, quit doing that and get into the reaper graphics industry uh, to make producing zines easier. It actually became that important to my life that I'd rather be working in an industry and working as a printer. So I worked as a printer for 30 years. Um, and on the side was able to knock out various, various books and zines. Uh, uh, I actually, um, as much as any, this is um, another one, yeah. As I was uh, also working on uh, little paperback books like this, which contains science fiction I wrote. Um, stuff I did was artwork of mine. Um, any little thing that crossed my mind that I wanted to, like, you know, air out and inflict on the world. I was doing. Uh, I don't know how many books I've produced so far, but quite a quite a good number. Um, Tim. Yeah. So my name is Tim. I work at the Somerville Public Library. So I'm a longtime zinester myself. Um, I run through the Future Press in my spare time. Most recently, I put together a book about underground punk spaces. Um, I'm lucky enough to have my stuff in different museums like MoMA and New York and whatnot. Uh, anyway, I just mentioned all that to say that I'm invested. I'm not just a, a librarian. Um, so I run the Somerville Public Library um, zine collection. 
And we have about 400 items, um, most of which can circulate. And even now you can request them from our website and you can get them on backlist pickup uh, through any Minuteman library. About a third of them are historic, including some of Seth's zines um, that are a little bit older. And so uh, you can't actually get them right now. Unfortunately, they're in library use only just because they're so um, precious. Um, so we launched in 2018, and here's uh, Pagan Kennedy, a uh, long time. I know her. <laughs> long time, some of those even start now, uh, New York Times uh, author, uh, who spoke at our launch party along with Jeff Chuckai. Uh We, and here's uh, some selections from our collection. Um, so we collect a bunch of stuff. We have uh, different sections, comics, health and wellness, music, poetry, uh, sort of the miscellaneous catch-all collection. And our motivation is to collect a unique area of uh, voices. Um, so voices that aren't often in the mainstream of published thought and you know, for that reason are all the more important uh, to collect and to spotlight. Uh, also the ephemeral nature of zines makes them important, I think, for a library to collect and preserve. Um, so Somerville has a pretty interesting uh, zine history. Paper Cup was in, was in Somerville for quite a while. Uh, but Pagan Kennedy from the 80s, here's one of hers. Um, Mousy, which is another title from that period, which featured, uh, which focused on bisexuality and discussions of racism. Um, There's also a number of uh, music magazines that started as zines that then became like glossies that came out of this scene. And we have all of this stuff uh, in the library. Um, and I just wanted to really briefly kind of run through the tricky part is talking about current stuff. So I'm just briefly random stuff that I think is really fascinating. Um, obviously I'm just picking and choosing randomly here, but uh, to give you a highlight of the collection. So Dave Ortega's explorations of his uh, grandmother's emigration from Mexico is Diaz de Consuelo, which is a series of um, self-published comics, really fascinating stuff. We have that. Um, Alex Kittle's zine on uh, women movie directors, which I wish I had an interior page, uh, but really fascinating line drawings, um, biographies of different women filmmakers. Um, I'm really a big fan of Gray and Ghost, which I think they're up in Salem now, but they do a lot of chat books and poetry books, essays. This essay right here is um, about um, swap meet vendors and um, tell some really fascinating stories. Um, Moon Eaters, we have some Moon Eaters stuff. Um, they're a local collective that produces work from an Asian Pacific Islander uh, queer femme perspective. Uh, we have some really great mini comics from Catherine Leaney, and these are all about self-care. Uh, this one is uh, Brain Why You Gotta, which I think is a great, great title. Um, we've got art zines, so uh, Neil Horsky's um, art and political zines. This one uh, rearranges phrases and words from the Constitution to make new meaning that maybe is uh, commentary on contemporary politics. And we've got a whole bunch of local poetry um, from presses such as Caddy Wumpus. Uh, this one is by Deborah Schwartz, and it's a great Zine. I also really like the, um, the, I don't know if you can see the modeled paper cover, I think is really great. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to give you a really brief overview of what we have. And I'll stop sharing now if the next person wants to take over. Thank you, Tim. That's a great collection. Okay, Adrian, do you want to talk about your projects? Uh, I could talk about the Dorchester Art Project and our zine library. Uh, which is undergoing uh, a lot of recent changes uh, as we are, as the uh, space is expanding uh, and we are actively uh, taking in zines whoop, all the time. Uh, and I'm actually in the process of actually categor uh, categorizing and um, bringing in a lot of these new volumes. Um, but we are currently open as uh, DAP is, um, uh, 7 a.m., 7 p.m. Uh, and uh, right now, uh, you can visit the zine library in uh, the Dorchester Art Project, uh, but uh, we are also in the process of moving it uh, to the uh, first floor and making it more accessible to uh, audience. Um, but we have a lot of volumes. Uh, I think 
one of the nice things uh, I think uh, Mona, I think you said earlier uh, about uh, fear persecution and, and being able to get sort of your voices out there. I think that is kind of the reason I am most interested in zines and what I'm really proud of the uh, Dorchester Art Project zine library for having is a uh, uh, volumes that are uh, tell stories from perspectives that uh, you might uh, not always hear from like for instance uh, Duplex Planet uh, is a uh, series of interviews uh, conducted at uh, retirement centers and uh, meal sites in New York City and Atlanta uh, and uh, one of my absolute uh, favorite couple of volumes out of uh, the library itself. Sorry, I'm just getting over on the screen share. And let me, yes. Uh, Food Justice for All is actually one of my absolute favorite uh, zines we have in the library. Uh, it definitely approaches like the difficulty and uh, financial inability that some people have in accessing healthy uh, food and why, you know, uh, <laughs> and, um, sort of like how simple, it, how uh, not easy it is as just simply eating better, but actually uh, in, how you are going to be limited by the community that you're in and the, what is offered to you. Um, and um, also uh, another one of my favorites, Six, Sick Woman Theory by Joanna Hedva, uh, which is all about how to protest and you know take part in action when you are sometimes physically debil or, or uh, mentally um, held up by illness. Um, so, uh, yeah, I am, I'm really proud of our collection and I've just started to, uh, curate it and I'm, um, excited by, uh, you know, what's to come. So uh, thank you. Okay. Thanks everyone for your introductions. Um, so this next part of the panel is more like a conversation. I have some questions that I sent all of you to start out with, but feel free to go wherever the conversation takes you. I'll also be reading out questions from uh, our audience periodically, and you can answer them. Just make sure you let each other finish before you start. So, okay. I'm going to start off with how do you think um, zines can get circulated more? Because I know you're all, a lot of you are librarians, basically and you want people to be reading zines more, right? So what, what, can, what kind of support would be helpful from like a institutional library point of view? So anyone, feel free to start. Um, one, one thing I would say is um, maybe offering copies for um, people to take. Um, I went to Simmons University for my master's uh, and they have a zine collection there and they publish students' zines for free for anyone to take. Um, and I think that was a really great opportunity to like want to start your own collection, but also see a broad range of topics that people were talking about. Um, one, uh, sometimes Paper Cut does events at um, public libraries where we talk about zine making. And I think just having like a chance to talk to people about like why it's important to make scenes is another like thing that could be good for getting people interested because I think like like sometimes at least for me like especially with like everything that's going on politically um and with the environment and all those types of things like people are kind of like what is the point of making art when we're kind of in this emergency state and I think it like helps us like get through like these times and like talk about them and um, talk about subjects that might not be so mainstream. So I think like first, like first and foremost, knowing that like your words matter and that it's important to even put them on a page and like uh, put our history sort of on a page is important too. Uh, I am a big fan of uh, the idea of mobile zine libraries. Um, like uh, digit digitization is definitely a um, a very big step at you know making it more accessible for a lot of people but that is a, a very big uh step um and so there a lot can be gained from like handling uh the the zines themselves and actually seeing how they're made and the idea of bringing them to locations like book fairs or or, or you know there are and there are things of course like new new zealand uh the idea of actually bringing the collection to the audience is something i am very uh i feel very strongly about is that something you've done before? 
Uh, no, no, it, it's just, it, it's more born out of my enjoyment of bringing, like, uh, of reading and bringing, like, uh, mini comics or zines to friends. And this is the idea of building, obviously not very uh, accessible right now during COVID, but uh, when all this is over. So I know Papercut has an online collection, right? You have scans of some of the zines. Do you, do you track how much usage that gets? and like statistics on how many people read them? Um, we are moving our catalog, so we will have that data soon. We actually just had a meeting about it, but at the moment, that's not something that I'm aware of that we're tracking. Um, but I did wanna just quickly to your, response, uh, to your question about how to get zines out there and have people read them. I think obviously zines can serve many different purposes. Uh, purposes. They could be documentation of someone's narration. But one of my favorite things that zines can do is be a call of action and really um, an activist's best tool. And depending on your definition of zine, in a way to pass information and respond to community need. And that's one of my favorite things that we do. Not to plug paper cut, but it is something I get very excited about is when we see a need and we respond and we create something and go to the event mm -hmm. um, to kind of deliver, if you will, um, similar to what Adrian was saying about having pop-up libraries. And we'll do that at shows as well. We'll have like pop-up libraries. And I think that's a, a really important power that it has that you could tap into. Do you have like a favorite example of a specific one? Um, so, uh, so, uh, there was a, um, Gabby, did you want to talk about it? Yeah, actually, I was going to say I can share my screen if you want to talk about, well, I did, uh, we do a harm reduction one, but I didn't include that one. I included the Girl Skate Day one. If yeah. you, I don't know if you want to talk about that one, but I can share. Um, sorry. Uh, we flipped it, Taylor flipped this around so that we could, um, so you can read it, but it, it would normally like look like this, like a, it's like a one page zine that folds up and you can put it in your pocket. Um, but so this is a, this was a, we never actually got this one out. The first time around we did a Girl Skate Day zine and then we made another one and then coronavirus happened. So the event didn't really happen, but I don't know if you want to talk about this more, Mona. Yeah, the first Girl Skate Day we did was four years ago now in Pop-Up Alston, the skate park that existed for a, for a hot second. And um, but it, what I was actually going, the example I was going to use is um, this report came out from the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts that there are a lot of overdoses due to a new substance that some users weren't finding. Um, that weren't typically like exposed to and it was causing death. And I, I just felt like in my community, it didn't seem like something that was believed. So first we put out a zine and people still, they, there was a lot of disbelief into the science. So then we made another copy with the, with the photocopy of the actual report from the Department of Public Health. And I feel like that one really kind of drove it home, you know, <laughs> just seeing the data and everything. So that would probably be one of my favorite examples. And then going to shows and with that zine, showing centers where you could go get help if needed, passing out free Narcan, passing out free supplies. Um, that was something that people really appreciated. This is um, a copy of that one right here. So yeah, originally the, um we didn't have this clinical advisory and then it was added afterwards to um, give it more validity. And I think what Mono is saying is true. It's like, it's uh, what, a nice thing about making zines too, is if you, if you are doing it as an activist thing and bringing it out into the community, then you can see how people are reacting to it and then add accordingly uh, based on what would better make it serve the community as well. Thanks for sharing those. Um... And do you also get a lot of like maybe less um, political or activist kind of scenes that are more about um, like autobiographical rather than a call to action kind of thing? 
that um, that you think you um, sorry, let me rephrase that. Um, I feel like there's a perception in the zine community sometimes that the art is only worth making if it very explicitly tells someone to do something or to believe something. But I think there's value in the kind of zine that just shows the person as they are as a, another way to get people to see um, a different point of view or um, to hear a different voice. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. I mean, personal zines are like, I think the one of the biggest parts of our collection. Mm -hmm. We have over 16,000, so <laughs> we pretty much have a good representation of a lot of different kinds. But thank you for saying that, it's so true. Sometimes just having narration, you know, in history, even in textbooks, as though textbooks have like more value or validity than uh, you know, someone self-publishing, but even there in history, like the Sioux Indians were called, that's not what they were called, the warring tribe in their language, Sioux Indians is the stupid people in that language. Mm -hmm. And they've tried for, you know, generations to change the textbooks and they haven't been able to, but, you know, maybe if there is an alternate form, an alternate, um, you know, way to get that message across, hey, that's not what we're called, we wouldn't be where we are. Yeah, because um, I feel like in mainstream publishing, as it moves towards more diversity, there's been like this, um, there's been a focus on using marginalized people as tools for education and as just something to learn from, like a teaching moment, rather than being people in their own right. So I don't know, uh, you guys are all librarians, right? You've seen the School Library Journal cover that just came out for Black History Month, um, centering whiteness, basically. And any thoughts on that and how zines are a useful tool to combat that? For anyone who doesn't know about the cover of uh, that journal that just came out, it's um, talking about why um, white kids need to read black zines, basically. And it's like a, a child holding up a zine and it's, um, it's like a white child holding up a zine with a black face of a, a, a face of a black person on it, like over their face. So like, it's kind of still centering whiteness even during black history month. And so um, just for for anyone who wants to respond to that question too, just if, they, if you haven't seen the, the cover of that. Um, but I think like um, one of the things I put under resources was, um, there's a, a, a distributor called um, Brown Recluse that does um, zines for and by queer and trans, uh, um, black and indigenous and people of color. So like things like that where um, if you're not seeing a space, I think people can kind of like, we talk about this with the girl skate day zine, but like if, if it like carving out a space for oneself too, like if you don't see that existing somewhere else, like especially like in a literary journal or whatever, we see that like, Mona said is being more or sometimes we're we're taught to believe that that's more valid but I think like with zines it's, it really can be about whatever you want so it can be just about telling your personal stories and it doesn't have to always be something um where it's a matter of like people you know like having to learn from someone else's pain in a way or um be tokenized Uh, anyone else have thoughts on that? Just one last thought. I think that, you know, zines are, are a tool, they're a technology, so they can be anything. And to pigeonhole it and say that they should have this kind of information or blah, 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 blah. Um, I think that it's like saying what music should be, you know, or what artwork should be. It's, it's a tool of expression and that could be used for whatever purpose that creator wants it to be. And mm -hmm. that's what's so powerful about it is that all those options exist. That being said, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, no, please, please continue. That being said, I do think that there is a certain amount of responsibility you have if you are sharing information that 
you don't know how that information is going to be taken. For example, we have a zine about um, DIY abortions. And, you know, maybe that was very valuable during a time when they were less accessible, but what responsibility do we have, if any, to put that out there and have someone see that and think that that means we're advocating that it's safe to give yourself an abortion and, and something terrible happens. So I think that's the kind of a tricky part of that powerful, completely open tool that we want to keep open that way. You know, a lot of people have odd messages. I have seen some, I have seen some zines in my time that have covered subjects that I consider just plain out unsavory. Um, one of the things about putting out your own publications is minority viewpoints and minority viewpoints come from all kinds of weird ass directions. Uh, so, you know, if you're collecting stuff, you're not necessarily saying that you advocate what's in your collection, but that you are, you're showing the diversity of viewpoint. Uh, Adrian, well, did you want to say something? Oh, no, well, sorry, that, that, that question really intrigued me, uh, actually, or, or that, 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 that um, Seth, what you said, because, um, yeah, I, I, I actually am I'm asking myself those questions, um, uh, engaging with uh, the zine library, and what what does it mean to have a zine in your collection? Like, to, to me, that, that was like, to collect something and to showcase a collection seems like two different uh, steps. And if you do showcase a zine in your collection, does that mean that you... I guess, as you're saying, like it is a minor opinion. So we, by just by virtue of the fact that it is, um, you know, like something that is not normally seen, is it something that is worth reading and hearing and seeing? So I guess, what what did you decide to do with the DIY abortion scene? So we ended up, we're, we have it in our collection, but we decided not to put it online. Okay. So we still have it. It's, I think it's really important to keep something like that. I don't think anyone would want to get rid of that zine, mm -hmm. but we do have some zines that have like Nazi paraphernalia, like hate in them that we thought would be harmful. And despite the documentation record keeping, we were like, this is no. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not like actively promoting it. You're just keeping it there in case anyone goes looking for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that was actually my question. So is it something that is accessible to the general public? Like you mentioned not having it online. So currently we're not a lending library because we're going through inventory of our 16,000 collection. <laughs> we're recataloging everything. Um, but normally you would be able to check it out. We are still a browsing library. So if you came and asked for that zine and you know, we were open and it was safe because of COVID, we would be able to find that zine, right? Right? Yeah, that said, that zine is also, um, we don't scan our zines currently, so that PDF is like one that we found elsewhere online. People can still find it themselves. It's also, it's just not like linked from our collection directly, um, in part because we're also working on a, a written kind of policy like to really settle down on um what we want to do consistently in this kind of case for going forward yeah, i was just curious so um we decided not to digitize any zines because a lot of things were uh created before digitization where maybe somebody didn't think a lot of people would ever see what they had created. And especially now, uh, there's a choice, you know, like if you want a ton of people to see something, then there's the internet. And if you want to create something that you don't want a lot of people to see, then there's paper. And so I think that our thinking was that we didn't want to digitize anything. Um, but so are you, are you all digitizing or you're just making available PDFs that you find? I'm just curious about that. Uh, I keep chiming in and that's because I'm the catalog director for PZL, um, but 
yeah, so what we did is we've had a ton of help from our awesome volunteers uh, really doing in-depth Google searches to find PDFs that are online elsewhere because our kind of assumption is like, if it's out there, then uh, someone wanted it out there. And we have actually seen in some cases on like the internet archive, a zine that was up got taken down because the owner decided to request that they do that. Um, but because of our limited resources, we would rather not take on that responsibility. So we'll say like, if it's somewhere, we'll link to it. Uh, we won't self host. If they take it down, they can take it down. Um, we're not making that call for anyone. Like you said, it's a, um, it's a tricky thing and we don't want to dive into that just yet. And I think it's important to say that we did the virtual catalog because of COVID. So there was no idea or desire to have one until we were like, oh, our friends are depressed at home. We have these cool zines. Can we get them to them? <laughs> How often do you ha have interactions like that with uh, zine authors? No one's asked us to, on our uh, online catalog, we have like a big disclaimer at the top of like, if you don't want your stuff here, email us in this way, this and that way. We have not heard it from anyone. Um, we have heard of people who want to give us our stuff, their stuff to put on our site. So, so far we've gotten more donations than we have any takedown requests. And again, part of that is because we don't, we, the only stuff we host is the stuff that creators give us directly, everything else we link out to, and then wherever that's hosted is where it would get taken down or not. And um, you all make your own zines, right? I'm guessing. What are some oh. of your favorite subject matter or mediums to work with? My stuff is more, more art and storytelling oriented. Um, I definitely prefer um, a lot of collaging and art in my, in my zines. Uh, I usually make them by hand and then take pictures of them so that I can digitize them uh, because that's currently the easiest way for me to share them. Um, and they're usually very personal for me. So I think about uh, what information do I need and kind of research it and share it with others, hoping that they'll need that information or I'll share something that I already know and found useful, especially um, a lot of my zines focus on self-care and healing from trauma. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like, what helped me heal? And how can I share this so that others can use these techniques? Uh, so I'm a big fan of using like just the simple, like, uh, like folded, printer paper model of zine making. Uh, I, I just find it very versatile and attractive. And, uh, you know, I've used it to make, uh, you know, small little just sort of, you know, art poem volumes about like, for instance, this uh, volume called Hence the Pencil. Uh, but as I've started um, sort of engaging uh, both, oh, sorry, in comics, um, the world of mental health comics and actually starting to sort of, um, as I'm uh, sort of uh, feeling more balanced and uh, sort of mindful of myself, uh, trying to sort of share um, lessons from uh, what I've engaged with. So, you know, I've uh, started to work on like single volume uh, little guides called such as how to calm yourself when your heart's beating too fast. Yeah, and so that's uh, me. Um, I make zines about cats. That's, that's it. <laughs> I put Love my it. personal work into other mediums. But yeah, cat zines. Cat, cats are great. We need more of them. <laughs> that's what I have to say. Half of the internet is cats. But there doesn't, doesn't seem to be a bottom to it. I like that. <laughs> uh, even, uh, may, may I ask uh, you as a moderator, because uh, I know you are a fantastic bookmaker. Uh, what, what physical forms do your zines take? Really basic printer paper, folded in half, stapled. Because um, when I'm doing my fancy book stuff, that, that takes a lot of energy from the bookmaking side of my brain. So when I'm making zines, I want something that's like brainless. Okay. I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, does anyone want to share like their favorite scenes, local or not local? I'm a big fan of uh, women in sound. 
which is a relatively new series that um, I forget where it's based, but it's like has a national focus and it's women performers, women um, you know, recording engineers and these really fascinating interviews. Um, if y'all are looking, if you're into music, y'all should check it out. Super cool stuff. Um, one of my favorite creators goes by uh, Femme Filth Press. Um, and they use a lot of radical love um, to talk about healing from trauma. And they're extremely bright and colorful and pastel and so truthful. Uh, it's really lovely to see. Anyone else? What is everybody like? Like for local creators, I'm always looking out for new and interesting local creators. Hey friends, those are most of the zines I read. I'm not nearly as much of a zine nerd as I want to be and wish I was. Um, but yeah, I love my friend zines. Actually, I think you must know, did you help put out that zine with Chris? Me, yeah, yeah. yeah that's an awesome. That's that's an awesome thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, he's a fascinating guy. Um, uh, Chris Strunk, who's a longtime uh, punk musician and show promoter, show putter together, and he's a librarian as well. He um, he put out a guide to uh, historic punk spaces of Boston uh, recently, and I published that. Oh, that's, that's a good. That's a good little zine. <laughs> So last one last shout out. Um, I really like Gabby's style, um, the zines Gabby's Gabby does, uh, because they have like a certain type of art. It just has like its own look. Um, it's really nice to see a zine that kind of looks so put together and standardized. And I could totally see you coming out with like a series of Gabs. Thank you. I will say like one of the things that I thought of when you asked this question is that I don't make scenes enough and that perfectionism is like a huge problem for me for making scenes. And Ian Des talked about this, um, who's another librarian, uh, during a presentation that we gave because um, Paper Cut's been doing like monthly skill shares uh, where we have like a different presenter each month talking about um, different things. Um, Marie just did a line of cut one, which is really cool. Uh, but me and Des did one together about zine making as like um, empowerment sort of. And we were, uh, Des shared like a photo um, and it says, uh, kill the colonizer in your head. And it was kind of in terms of talking about like perfectionism and like, um, like I think this idea of good and bad, like we get to a point in life sometimes where like when you're a kid, you're just like following a line and making something and you're not thinking about whether it's good or bad. And then we learn to put it into these like kind of um, terms that are almost um, puritanical of like good and bad. And so I think like moving away from that when you're making anything so that you can um, just make with joy is kind of like a radical kind of thing that you can do. And I think getting past that point when, when you're making something is really important too. That's actually a really good point. And I think it gets at, um, you know, as I mentioned, I like using the printer paper, uh, like as just like, you know, the simplest medium. And the, part of it is connecting to, as you sort of mentioned that the sort of a childhood, that trying to get closer to your, ch the, 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 the way your artist child sort of makes work. And for me, that is like going back to using old dot matrix printer paper, you know, making comics as a kid. And so I think by, by going back to that source, you, you, it, it frees up the brain from like trying to make it seem too precious. Uh, speaking of preciousness and um, I don't know what Gabby was saying. So the past number of years, there's been like a rise of like art zines and like, especially in the Boston area, you know, like the Boston Art Book Festival and all that. And it always seems like there's this divide between like zinesters and art zinesters. I don't know if anybody else notices that. I was just curious what, what the other panelists like thought about that. Are you talking about like the fandom zines with like really high production quality and they have like artist selection 
applications. <laughs> is, is that what you're talking about with the art scene? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like the Boston Art Book Fair and the Cyclorama. Um, uh, yeah, like very, focuses very, very much on the, the texture of the paper and the presentation, um, as opposed to maybe what Adrian was talking about with uh, super DIY, super basic, the focus is getting it out there. But maybe that's not really what you're saying, Adrian. Sorry. Well, no, no, but it does bring up an in interesting question because you do have uh, those art scenes. Like, typically, in, in your experience, do you like recall how much they they typically run to like purchase a volume? Because that I imagine being a very big difference between that sort of the DIY accessibility and you know these you know finer quality presses. Some like of the books that I made um, are like had very had very high production values and cost a lot to make and some of them were called some, some of them i was having to charge like 15 bucks a piece for which is a lot for which is a lot for a, a knockoff zine and they were in very very limited editions so those would count sort of as like you know fine art book kind of things but um I sort of went a little bit overboard with that. If I was going to get back into doing it now, I'd be I'd be trying to do something a whole lot more basic. I think. So, are you kind of like talking about how maybe that higher production quality is a bit alienating for um, more basic Z creators? I I like all stuff. I like I like the two pages folded and stapled. In the corner. Someone mentioned in the chat that it's intimidating. Oh yeah. You could make the argument that like talking more about the low I like I like Christina's point that it's nice to have a spectrum. And if we as seen stirs talk more about the fact that there is a spectrum that oh look at these very low budget ones that are still very cool. I think if that was more widespread cool like the high production value, I think, is like very Instagrammable and stuff, and so it gets around maybe a little bit more. But if we put more of the low end side of things out there, it will get balanced out almost. So uh, Olivia mentioned in the chat that um, many, sorry, the problems arise when privileged people who make expensive art zines push out marginalized people from spots at Zine Fest. So um, do you feel like that is something you actively try to avoid in your collections, like? maybe not prioritizing fancier or nicer books to acquire? Huh. I've never been to a zine fest, first of all. Um, but I've, I've done everything from the, the, from the most cheapo production in the world to, you know, very high-end glossy stuff. I, I think every production creates its own necessity for how, how it has to be done. For like my own personal connect collection, I typically don't buy uh, fancy art scenes. When I go to a zine fest, I really seek out the DIY publications that people put hard work into. Uh, well, you know, not like the art scenes didn't put hard work into it too, but it's more like, I feel like it's more of an authentic self, like a per zine, uh, and I definitely seek those out. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for more, uh, like a more intimate connection with the creator? Yeah. I think there's something unspoken being said when someone comes out with a production that took a lot of like money and resources. And again, we might not realize it. And, you know, I'm not to project on what other people do, but I think it's really easy for me to be like, oh, this has more value or this somehow is more valid because they have the funding and you know they have the perfect picture whatever versus my scraggly little whatever it is i'm doing at the time so i i think i could see your point tim about why maybe there might be kind of like a side eye towards more privileged spectrum of z making and the space that it takes up um but it really like all it, it, there's room for all of it you know mm -hmm. and I don't think we need to be bitter or hateful about what some people do. Um, it's, you know, not to say that anybody here was, but I have seen that kind of attitude before. And I think that they're just completely different things, just like a purse scene and an activist scene. They're two different things as well. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. And like speaking about sort of cost and um, like, you know, I, I, if I am attracted to like a very, a very like glossy, well-bound art zine, I'm going to maybe, you know, I'm probably going to buy the art zine, but I may only buy one of them because like, okay, well, this is the one I'm going to get. And whereas, you know, I may spend, you know, $30 on little mini comics, you know, at mice or something like that. And for me, it, it is a lot about like, you know, I, I want to see as many people in the tent as possible, as many people making it. So I do like, I will buy those, you know, nice art zines and have them in my collection. But um, I also kind of, the reason I'm into zines is because I do want to hear as many stories as possible. And um, that is kind of where I'm going to invest more of my, you know, money and attention. So quantity. Oh, uh, one thing I want to say is that, especially when I was first getting into publishing in the uh, in the early '80s, is the thing that kept on coming up in the zine scene that people would say was that freedom of the press belongs to someone who owns one, um, which is why I got into the printing business because I wanted to have a press right at my fingertips. Um, but the thing is, is that. Uh, You get into doing that and there's a lot to be said for every every point on the spectrum for, for doing what you have to do, for the things you want to say, for the things you want to produce, for what you want to show people. Um, give me a second. Uh, when it's really easy to make a quick fourfold fourfold zine if you want to just put, put something out there right away and I think that everybody should have access to being able to do that um, and there's some, there's a lot to be said for being able to make something very, very glossy what's great is that the internet came along about halfway through the period that I was doing publication and if you want to put something on the internet it's like anybody can make something that's really polished and glossy looking if they don't have to put it on paper and in a, in a lot of the way a, a lot of ways paper itself is becoming very redundant uh, the age of paper is coming to an end um, which is why I'm no longer in the printing business because it's uh, print doesn't seem to be that relevant anymore and I think that's great because that means anybody can make something that looks just as good as like a super pro magazine if they master a few basic pieces of software and have internet access and have a website there it is the website is a, the the website is sort of the ultimate zine and i think that's sort of where the best i think that's sort of where the best of that stuff is heading right now so Tim, as someone who is only collecting physical copies and not public, not digitizing any of it, do you um, agree with that? Um, no, not really. Um, I I think that I mean I'm a librarian, right? I think that I think that paper is is wonderful for a whole host of reasons. Um, I mean I think that I think that. To your point, Seth, about all you need is the programs and the website. I mean, that's also a barrier for people too. And I think that what's super cool about some of the, you know, more very DIY photocopied scenes is it has such a, a low barrier. Um, but what I like about print and why I think that it's good as a public library to uh, collect and preserve these is that they do last and uh, people can see these you know 20 30, 40 years later i mean like think about all those browser tabs you have and that you accidentally closed you have no idea where they are anymore you know like it, we have this stuff on the second floor of the main library that you know are those browser tabs and you can come by and you can check them out they're still going to be there um, I don't know. Uh, I have to say I'm biased. Like I'm a bookbinder. I make books from scratch, sometimes paper too. 
So I really believe in physicality and the tactility of knowledge as something that um, as a physical creator and a physical audience, there's something more present when you have like a book as opposed to a website, right? So you, you can take on more dimensions as well. There, there's things you can do with the digital medium like GIFs and scrolling and animations. But I think that being able to smell, to hear and to like touch something gives it so much more presence and that presence helps ingrain the knowledge or the understanding of whatever the content is better. So my, that's my take on it. Uh, anyone else want to say something? Physical books are very seductive. God knows I have way too many of them here. You know, I, 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 I get it. They smell good. It's fun to hold them in your hands. Um, but uh, I, I, I do think that the internet is sort of the future of the independent person um, being able to get the word out about whatever their particular tiny focused obsession is about. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's what zines are about, is about somebody's tiny focused obsession. Um, you know, you can print 50 copies of something or you can make it available to 4 billion people. Um, you know, and obviously not all 4 billion are going to access that, but it's there. Um, maybe you can do both, but, uh, you know, it's, you know, I, I just sort of feel that like paper at this point is kind of like, you know, um, you know, it's this, it's this sensual diversion in a way. Mm -hmm. I, I love books. I love the way they smell. I love being in a library and getting that smell of books, you know, but it's, uh, it's, it's something that like, in a way, I, I, I'm sort of trying to train myself to get over. I'm not being that successful at it, but I'm, I, but you know, it's, it, it's, 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 it seems like it seems like the internet is something that is more welcoming to more people. Um, I don't expect everybody to agree with me about it, but it's uh, it's kind of where I'm at about it. I do find your point interesting about um, it is easy for kind of an average person to make something that is visually you know slick looking, so that there is like a level there is something like the. Uh, democracy of visuals there where and, and like you can eat like even full professional businesses i'm sure we visit websites that are like you know still ha like still kind of have like uh you know off colors or 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 you know old gifts on them and then they're, they're pretty poorly put together and so there is that sort of a um you know if, if you are industrious and you do have access to the tools and that is a barrier um, as well as, you know, internet connection, hosting, all that stuff, those, those things can be taken away from you. Um, there, there is a difference, like a person who has a very, very niche interest can put something up. It can seem very um, professional and, and it can draw more people to it uh, in a way, in a different way than, you know, a, something that you can make handmade in the same time in physical media. Um, I think something that's interesting to point out is that at the turn of the century, people thought that blogging was going to replace zines, but it didn't. It didn't last as well, uh, and zines made a comeback. And so I think there's there's a uh, fading in and out of print being popular or not, um, and I think a lot of people are turning back to paper because we're always on our screens lately. And I want to go back to what Tim said earlier about how some people choose to print in paper. And because of that, you think you don't want to have the digital versions like, digitized. So when, when they choose to print in paper, do you think it's because they don't want to reach as large an audience that they could using the internet? Um, and why do you think that is, or what kind of effect do you think that has when you don't reach as large an audience? 
Yeah, it seems like a, a conscious choice. You know, like you can make something with paper. The people that I talk to about this, you can make something with paper that has visuals and that has tact, you know, the tactile sense that uh, is a goal. And the trade-off there is that not as many people are going to see it and they're okay with that. But some people also are expressing views that they don't want associated with them in a findable way. And so you can still, you know, like even with, with social media, you know, it's all getting hoovered up. All of your private thoughts are being hoovered up. So if you want to express it in a way that other people can read and see and interact with, then paper is safer. And so it seems like a conscious decision on the part of some creators that have spoken to the police that you create a zine because you want to um, limit the, the reach of it. It seems weird, but there you go. And as a reader, how, how do you feel about that? Like, do you feel um, a closer connection when you realize the creator is trying to keep the audience limited? Or does that affect it? Does that affect your reading at all? Yeah, because then it's that much more special. You know, like you're one of the 25 people who has this. And <laughs> it's, it's magical. So like limited edition print runs, basically. Yeah, that your friend made and they sent to 24 other people. Maybe it's worth money, but it's the, it's the intimacy of the connection that kind of makes it magical. Well, I think there's room for every size in terms of audience and distribution. Uh, we have a question from Amelia about how you find the zines that you enjoy, like personally, and I guess for your collection as well, besides people just giving them to you. I just want to say real quick, I just want to add to what Taylor was saying about blogs and people thinking zines were going to go out. So I actually uploaded this paper. It's kind of a thick read, but um, it's this very famous classic pianist. He had done the most performances of anybody. And then the uh, recording music happened, the invention of recording music happened. And he just abruptly quit and said, <laughs> performance is a thing of the past. There's no longer going to be performers anymore. Um, and I, I just think that that's like a you know, not to, I'm not trying to like um, go against what you said, Seth. I think that definitely, obviously online stuff is like a huge presence, but at the same time, does it matter if you're passionate about something, if you like something? And I always felt like Glenn Good, he kind of acted like, you know, like someone who was afraid to get hurt almost or go after something he liked. So he just quit before performance broke up with him. He broke up with performance first and it's kind of sad. You know, it's uh, John Philip Sousa, of course, had that famous essay, The Menace of Mechanical Music, that was about recording. Um, and, you know, I, you know, print and the internet can coexist. There's no question about that. There's a, uh, but I just, um, it, I, I guess there is the question of how many people do you want to reach versus do you want to make a thing? I often want to do both. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's no reason why the two can't exist together, but I just sort of feel that like the future of reaching people is on the internet. That's all. It's um, it's not necessarily a challenge. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, the it's just the way that things seem to be going right now, and I want to point out that it's right now. You know, it's like uh, you know, we're one zombie apocalypse away from everything changing. So you never know. Uh, a question from the audience: Does anyone know how one might get one's hands on a copy or copies of Alarums and Excursions? I highly suggest reaching out to your local librarian. And I think I see one who might be Googling it right now, but just in general. <laughs> <laughs> but in general, it's like 
reach out to a librarian, Zine Librarian, or Somerville Library mm -hmm. too, I guess, to say the Zine Library now. Oh, and uh, I see in the chat people are discussing how to sell your zines. So online, I prefer store and view to Etsy because on Etsy, you have to list and give a commission fee before you sell anything. But store and view only charges you a commission when you actually sell something. So that's what I personally use. Does anyone else want to suggest? Besides like going to a zine fest, which we can't do right now, of course. Um, I mean, I usually go to Etsy and if I find someone I like, I follow them on Instagram. And a lot of times, you know, they might have their own website that they sell off of, but doesn't get as much traffic as their Etsy, or you can just buy one directly from them through Instagram using like Venmo. Um, and then I usually just like find people that way. Like, you know, they'll suggest someone or they'll post about someone that they're reading and then I'll go to that person and you kind of get down a giant hole of zine artists. So basically like following breadcrumb trail from one Instagram artist to another. Yeah, that's generally how I find them. Yeah, similar uh, for me, uh, mostly, but I discovered Etsy or my partner shared with me Etsy as a means to find zines uh, early on in the pandemic. And that's kind of been where I've at, I'm at. Uh, Instagram. And also, um, there's a lot of zine distros that I really like. And so I just check them out occasionally and what their new offerings are. I also get a lot of like personal recommendations from people that I've met over the years who are interested in the same uh, kind of small publications. Uh, and Gumroad, yes, Gumroad's pretty good too. Also, um, someone asked, what are zine distros? Sure, they're on zine distributors, distro short for distributors. Um, so there's uh, an ever-changing cast of them. <laughs> so you just kind of have to keep looking around. Uh, they, they're works of love. Um, I mean, there's a few like microcosm that are like, nobody actually makes their living off of microcosm. Um, but like Antiquated Future, I saw somebody talking about Antiquated Future. That's sort of a labor of love. Um, there's, Mass Love is a relatively newish one in the Boston area, maybe. Um, but basically, uh, somebody will uh, give, yeah, they, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they function like mini bookstores. Um, and they'll take, you know, a half or 60% or 40% of the, the transaction and they'll get you into people's eyeballs for sure. You know, in the early 90s, uh, I was involved in something called the Small Press Alliance, which was an attempt at creating something like that. We did not make it work. I want to make it really clear. We did not make it work, but uh, it was the idea of creating a small press distributorship. Uh, the upside of it was that I got to know a lot of people in the, uh, in the zine scene at that time um, who remain, I remain close to, but it didn't quite work out. So I'm really happy to hear that some people managed to make that sort of thing work. And someone mentioned that Simmons has a list as well. Uh, there's a, a Simmons Zine Fest, a feminist Zine Fest, if I remember correctly, that happens, is it yearly? I'm not sure, but I know that Simmons has been um, sharing some of their student work online too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Don left. Uh, Don ran that, and I think she left Simmons. So I don't think that that's happening anymore. Yeah, she uh, did leave Simmons, unfortunately, uh, to go to another college. Uh, but they still have their collection there, uh, which you can go and visit when they're open. Uh, and if you go to Simmons or one of the colleges of the Fenway, you can borrow the zines as well, like uh, Summer Republic does. So um, we're heading into the last 15 minutes of the discussion. Are there any questions that I missed? If so, please let me know in chat. And if our presenters want to say any last comments or promote anything like their websites or locations. 
um, I posted a bunch uh, a bunch of links to digitized versions of some of my zines in chat. Uh, feel free to check them out. They're not all what I would call politically correct or any of that stuff, but some of you might find them amusing. Just be advised. I just want to share that um, my family, I'm kind of going through some stuff with my family immigrated from a country where we were politically persecuted. So sometimes I have this battle inside about what to share. And if I share something, will a family member, you know, back in my parents' country, ancestral country, pay the price? And, you know, with great power comes great freedom. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And that's what I feel like, but it feels a little bit like a catch 22. So my long winded way of saying, if you haven't found your voice yet, which I don't feel like I have, that's okay. And I've been working at a zine library for a really long time. So I think that um, also speaks to maybe limiting your audience, right? Like having things in uh, paper form rather than well, uh, thank you everyone for sharing today. I think we had a lot of different opinions and maybe didn't quite come to any conclusive agreement on some topics, but that's the beauty of zines and indie publishing. You can have everything. So, uh, any closing words from anyone else? Yeah, I was just gonna say um, if Anyone is interested, uh, if you just motor on over to somervillepubliclibrary.org and you go to um, go to, I should know where it is, under collections, uh, you can see our zine and small press collection. There's a link to our catalog, which, uh, like I said, if you are in the Minuteman Library Network, uh, you can request things. Uh, sent over to your local library and you can check them out. Oh, uh, one more question in chat. How do Zinesters promote their work? At Zinefest and Word of Mouth mostly, uh, publicists for, as a publicist for books, uh, Christina is interested in how the subculture works. Uh, in my case, uh, I tell people about it on Facebook mostly. Uh, Back, back in the day, there used to be this great magazine called Fact Sheet 5 that actually reviewed zines. Um, long gone, but it was possibly the most single important zine in the zine scene in the 80s and early 90s. Um, I gave my entire collection to Tim um, to put in the Somerville Library. Um, but that I there's no tool like that today, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, for me, it's mostly Instagram and uh, kind of through friends. Twitter is another big one, of course. Kind of depends whether you're more into images or words, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, and Facebook group for zines or per zines. By the way, if anyone is interested in leading a workshop at Papercut Zine Library, just drop us an email. You could Google us and find us. Yeah, we've been hosting them monthly uh, since October. And it's all virtual, I assume? Yeah. Yeah, one yeah. of the about it is that I think a lot of people who are who have been doing them are like not necessarily like people who have done a workshop before it's just like they have a skill that they want to share and it gives you kind of an opportunity to like um create like you know a slideshow and presentation of how you would share that with folks and I think it's like been pretty cool for people like I know I I gave one of them at the beginning um and I had never like done anything like that or like, like in a professional kind of sense and it felt kind of empowering to do that. Hope is we're not there yet but the hope is to then have a way that you can contact Skillshare leaders to hire them for doing workshops at your library after school programs whatever. Oh wow. We're trying to we're trying to help be a conduit for 
connecting all the talent that exists in our community with people who are looking for talent. Now everyone's links together with the uh, Zoom recording. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's been great to have uh, so much audience participation as well. If that's all, thank you everyone again for being here. It was really an honor to have creators and curators here tonight, especially as we're thinking about how we want to develop our collection and possibly workshops and stuff like that. Well, thank you, Heven, for uh, moderating. Uh, thank you for keeping the discussion moving along. Yes, thank you. <laughs>